Councilmember Mann? <clears throat> I wanted a clarification from uh, Mr. Hood, did, did, or maybe from Ms. Brenner. I, I thought, I didn't think it was ecology that was saying it's unfeasible to do the 87%. It's that the county sent a letter to ecology saying that it's not yeah, feasible to do yeah, the 87%. Yeah, but it's a new development. Right, but he, you also said that, you know, that now, you, well, we've been saying that all along, so why suddenly have you seen the light? So I do think, <laughs> it, I'm I, sorry, I, I think you meant it might be unfeasible even for you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm always uh, more optimistic perhaps than justified. Um, and I'm often surprised okay. by how right I was by being optimistic. Um, mm -hmm. but, but what is different is Whatcom County told me in their comment that, that they did not believe it was feasible to meet 87%. So my, my great support previously for the water quality offsets was based on the idea that you would, in good faith, go and attack that 87% after we've dealt with the, with the new development. And that's that's been, you know, our agreement all along. It's like we've understood that new development is just a matter of, you know, digging our hole a little bit deeper. And that that's our first step is to stop digging the hole deeper. And then we would next move on to the 87%. And so I just wanted to qualify that, that while I think it's a great idea to, to put the resources where they're going to do best, and the idea of the Homeowners Association taking on that role of, of balancing the reductions from the land across the homeowners association is a great idea. I think, in light of your 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 concern that you may not be able to meet the eighty-seven percent, you really need to look at that whole picture when you when you deal with the homeowners association, and not just the new development. Hmm. One Thank other you. question Thank for Mr. Know. Hood, if I could. Uh, you you didn't say that one type of phosphorus is pop pollution and another type of phosphorus is not, yeah, right? Totally what you said is one type of phosphorus you have jurisdiction over and the, and the diversion phosphorus you do not have jurisdiction over. Correct. They're both yeah. relatively equivalent types of polluting phosphorus. Maybe some's soluble or organically available or maybe it's bound up differently, but oh. phosphorus is phosphorus. Okay. You weren't trying to say anything different, were you? Well, um, okay. I'm there's like four questions kind of buried in that. Get statement. them all. Answer them all. <laughs> okay. Um, the first is, is about the jurisdiction. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we don't regulate interbasin transfers and that, and we cannot use a TMDL to impair a water right. Um, phosphorus, you know, is a pollutant, but it's also a necessary, we would have no fish at all in Lake Wacom if we had no phosphorus at all. Um, so it would not be healthy to have no phosphorus. What we're looking at is, is, you know, matching that natural level of phosphorus. And so, in fact, you know, as, as uh, Councilmember Crawford pointed out, you know, we're targeting about, and now I've gotten so lost with all the numbers and I'm still suffering from a cold, um, whether it's 3,000 pounds or 3,000 kilograms coming from that watershed, um, you know, that's, that's more or less the, the natural level of phosphorus that comes from within that watershed. Um, on, the, on the middle fork... The phosphorus that comes from the Middle Fork is somewhat different. Um, and there's, there's a number of things that make it somewhat different. And, and I'm going to kind of leave it a little bit fuzzy. Um, it's, it's mostly um, inorganic phosphorus that's attached to, to, you know, it's basically mineral phosphorus. So it's not as readily taken up. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be taken up because, you know, our trees grow out in forest soils and they're always extracting phosphorus out of the soil. But it, it takes longer to get that phosphorus and it takes more energy than, the, than the, um, the organic phosphorus. So because it's basically ground up rock, it's less available than the phosphorus that runs off of our landscape. The other thing that's going on is, is on those warm summer days when the, when the phosphorus is coming in from the diversion, that water's really cold. I mean, if you've ever gone and stood in that creek on a summer day when the diversion is running, it's, it's chilly. That's because it's glacier water. So it actually, um, you can see as it flows into the lake, it, it sinks down, and it, and it basically is going to meet at that bottom layer of the epilimion. So it's not really in that photic zone where the runoff that occurs during the summer occurs. So it's probably not as active. So there's a number of things that make that diversion somewhat different. The other is that, you know, over the long haul, we've seen the diversion quantities drop and our water quality decline. So, you know, we may be seeing evidence that, in fact, 
the water that the diversion brings in creates as much assimilative capacity as it uses. Um, so the final thing is about the phosphorus is phosphorus and what's natural. You know, early on we looked at water quality trading and we got a grant from EPA and they really, they identified the Middle Fork diversion as the biggest potential for a water quality trade. And um, our program said, well, that's, that's not available for trade because if you can reduce the phosphorus that's in that diversion, then that should be adjusting what our natural condition is. And so that's really what it comes down to. Unless, unless our administration is changing that, until we establish a TMDL and kind of fix where we are, you know, we're kind of in a state where if we, we are going to say that diversion is being offered, operated differently, then our natural condition is going to also change. Well, no, the diversion isn't natural. Executive Laos wanted to make a comment. Yes, if I may. Um, the TMDL study, I understand, started in about 2009. This, the county asked a series of questions of, of ecology at that particular time. We've had very sporadic um, interaction with ecology from 2009 up until when the uh, draft report was uh, released here just a few months ago. We sent a letter uh, just in the last uh, little bit, and I'd ask that our public uh, assistant public works director, Chris Bruski, um, speak to that because he penned it and his signature is on it, that basically asks the same series of questions again that identified that we need answers to these before we can figure out whether we can come to this con come into compliance with what's asking of the TMDL. Along with that, uh, we had a meeting of uh, various department heads with the director of ecology, the regional director, and uh, the local manager here a few weeks ago and got the head nod from the director that they were going to work with Washington County as they work through these issues before issuing the final report on the TMDL. So. Given an opportunity to expand on that, is I'm very curious uh, concerning some of Mr. Hood's comments tonight and would like the opportunity to talk to him and to talk to Ecology about the TMDL report. But I'd ask if, uh, if, if the council would be obliging to listen to Chris Bruski just to kind of explain what was in that letter and why we sent it concerning the TMDL. And Madam Chair, while he's coming up, I just wanted to clarify, uh, because Steve and I were confused on the numbers, the, the, I just pulled up the TMDL. The uh, current annual loading, well, the 2003 model year annual loading, is 8,708 pounds of phosphorus going into the lake total. That's from development and natural conditions. And the target of natural conditions only is 5,575 pounds. So the reduction that that is being asked for is 3,133 pound reduction. When uh, I'm starting to understand now when Mr. Hutchings about a year ago said that uh, his recollection, I, I don't know if he even wants me quoting him because it, it was probably off the cuff, but I think he said it represented about two, 22%. Uh, this 600 and some pound number that the city, that he's saying that maybe the city uh, had and maybe was used in the TMDL is about 20% of that 3,133 pound uh, reduction. So what we're, what ecology wants to see is a 3,133 pound per year reduction in the current loading of 8,708 pounds. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Chris Bruski, Public Works. Uh, I just, I guess briefly would like to just clarify what our comments actually were on the TMDL because I think they're either um, being mis mischaracterized or, or misunderstood. Um, as the executive said, we submitted a series of comments on the first draft of the TMDL in 2009. Um, these are extremely complicated comments, both technical and procedural issues that we had raised about the way certain things were calculated, um, about the procedure that, that the entire TMDL process was, was going through. Um, those comments were largely not addressed by DOE in 2009. So our comments that we resubmitted last month were essentially the same. A couple of small tweaks here and there, but Councilmember Brenner uh, I think was correct when she said that, that there was really nothing new earth-shattering in our, in our latest comment letter. What we asked for in that comment letter, and I, I, I will get you guys, I'll email you a copy of our comment letter tomorrow, um, was the final paragraph where we said, we asked basically for Ecology to sit down with us at a table and work through these very, very technical uh, and, uh, and procedural questions that we've had 
and address them. Don't gloss them over. Um, and by doing that, we'll maximize our chances of succeeding in implementing this TMDL. And this is obviously a very high priority for us to succeed in doing this, but there's certain ways uh, or certain, certain technical issues in here that need to be resolved. And that's what we've asked for, and that's what we asked the Director of Ecology for, is just to commit to sitting down with us, not sending out a comment sheet that largely ignores our comments, and sending it on to EPA for finalizing. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so we do have a motion on the floor to um, refer this to the Natural Resources Committee. Is there any further discussion on that? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, that passes six to one with Council Member Weimer opposed. Thank you all for your testimony and your information and your time tonight on that issue. Oh, I know. We should have been there. Okay. So moving on to our second public hearing, we have an ordinance establishing the Superior Court Fourth Judge Courtroom Renovation Project and establishing a project-based budget for the Fourth Judge Courtroom Renovation Project. And is there a staff that wishes to make a report to us tonight? I'm not seeing one. So I will open the public hearing. Executive Laos, did you want to say anything about the fourth court, uh, uh, fourth superior court courtroom renovation project? I'll make it very brief. I'm excited that we have this opportunity to uh, add the fourth superior court judge uh, to make that happen by January 1 of 2015. Uh, we need to uh, work together. I've already convened meetings of the uh, judges, uh, court clerk, um, various uh, cons various groups within uh, county government. Uh, we've gotten together and put the plan together, and I would encourage the council to uh, make this uh, make this happen by uh, taking a positive action on the request tonight. Thank you. Okay, we do not have anybody signed up to speak at the public hearing. Did anybody wish to speak at the public hearing? on this matter. Come on it. Ellen Baker Glacier. I just wanted to say Madam I really... Chair, you, they can't do this with those people talking there. Oh, okay. Can I ask uh, people to please uh, discontinue conversations? Just briefly to say that I'm very familiar with uh, the backlog of cases and I understand that this is a really important move. I would hope that this moves along very quickly. I'm not sure what's happening with the... Uh, uh, actual selection of the judge. We could have a judge. But I, I, we definitely need to have this courtroom, and I hope it has super high priority. I think that's fabulous. I just want to make sure that priority stays high. I know the legal community needs this courtroom. Thanks. Wait, point of clarification? Go ahead, Councilman Mann. Are you, are you actually telling us we're doing something right today? I, I, oh, I often do. Yes, she does That is sometimes. awesome. Thank you. Okay, does anybody else wish to speak to us about the um, fourth Superior Court courtroom renovation project? I can think of some other people that could come up and support No, nope, I think we'll close <laughs> the public okay. hearing. Thank you very much. All right, so what are the wishes of the council? Madam Chair, I move that the uh, council adopt the ordinance establishing the Superior Court fourth judge courtroom renovation project and establishing a project-based budget for the fourth judge courtroom renovation project. All right, comments and discussion, Council Member Brenner. Well, I have to say, while I appreciate the comment about we are, do have a backload, I have mixed feelings if we're not going to get some money from the state to help us out with this, but I was very impressed with the executive's comments today that actually doing, we'd need to do this whether we did a fourth um, court, judge courtroom or not because uh, there's some improvements that have to be made. So. I feel like the balancing act is fine. I still hope we can get some kind of grants or funds from the state to help with at least, you know, staffing it or something. We're going to have to use REIT 2 money if we don't, right? Just kidding. No, I can't use REIT 2 money. <laughs> Sorry. That's not a stormwater facility. You can't use REIT 2 money. Well, it just Re brings up the, it does bring up the question, you know, the, uh, the Bar Association, I believe, you know, was really, uh, I was on a committee where they, they several, for a couple of years ago, and, and Executive Kremen, I think, was part of that, where they really pressured us to, to do this. And I'm just wondering if the national 
bar association or something would have grants for this sort of thing. I mean, it's not beyond the realm of, of considering it would be logical that they would support, uh, you know, municipalities having the resources uh, for the interests that they advocate for. Executive Louse. If I may, it, it typically resides upon the local jurisdiction to provide the the facilities and the support staff for the Superior Court judge. Of course, this, the state will be packed picking up half of the Superior Court judge's wages um, and the benefit package associated with that, and that's what they approved. Uh, I, I don't anticipate and don't know of any way that we're going to get um, state funding to help with the construction of it. And just as a note for the community to know, it, it the governor will have the opportunity of making the first appointment to this and then through the next election cycle, then the voters of Whatcom County will uh, continue to elect the Superior Court judge. Great. Councilmember Kremen. Thank you, Madam well, Chair. I um, do, Mr. Executive, it's my understanding that uh, we will be able to realize some uh, economic benefits or reductions in salaries, are we not going to be reducing maybe at least one commissioner, possibly two? We aren't, at this point, as far as I know, we aren't planning on reducing commissioners, but the judges have committed to uh, putting the courtroom up and putting the electronic devices in necessary to do the video recording and the auto recording, which is going to reduce the staffing levels for the whole system. So they've made that commitment, and that's balancing out uh, with the additional costs that we're going to have uh, supporting the judge. Well, proportionately, Mr. Executive, I think it would be prudent to take a closer look at uh, how many commissioners we actually have uh, compared to our population base. And uh, I think that there's the potential for some savings realized there by uh, reducing at least one commissioner. At least I think that ought to be looked at. I'll take that under advisement and I'll uh, have the opportunity to uh, talk with the uh, judges uh, concerning that at a future date. But thank you for bringing that up. Councilmember Brenner. Well, another um, thing I'd like you to look at since you're looking at all this stuff would be to, we have uh, jobs that go away by attrition and if we have some that are not as essential as this is, we need to do our priorities and our balancing act so we could maybe make it revenue neutral by the time the judge gets appointed. Okay, any further comments or discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Barbara Brenner? Yes. Sam Crawford? Yes. Kathy Kirshner? Yes. Bill Knudsen? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. Okay, that passes 7 to 0. Moving on to our third public hearing, we have an ordinance amending Whatcom County Code, Title 20, the official Whatcom County zoning maps, and the Whatcom County Comprehensive Plan and Maps to implement changes related to rural land use planning. Thank you. And, Gary, are you going to give us a bit of a status report? Yes, thank okay. you. Just a brief presentation. Gary Davis, Whatcom County Planning and Development Services. Tonight, I just want to briefly run through the issues that are in the ordinance that uh, the council introduced on June 4th and also go over the schedule from um, the beginning of this phase on through uh, completion. First issue, a variety of rural densities. This is the one where the compliance order uh, noted that only 21% of the rural area is zoned R10A and was concerned that there was no uh, criteria in place preventing all of that area, all of that percentage to be rezoned to a higher density. So proposed in the ordinance is policy 2GG3. Changes to that policy uh, would place criteria on the eligibility to apply for rezoning from R10A to a higher density. And first one is that the average size of parcels containing a residence as of January 1st, 2013, within 500 feet of the area to be rezoned is less than 7.5 acres. And that's designed to 
assure that uh, a proposed rezoning would be consistent with uh, uh, existing um, rural densities in the area. Second one is that the proposed rezoning would not be in an urban growth area reserve. And the third one is that the proposed rezoning area would not be in a rural study area. This is the chart uh, that uh, represents the way the uh, breakdown is now of the, of the rural lands. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, you can see 21.8% is R10A. That is as of now and as of the uh, 2012 ordinance that was adopted. With this proposed change in policy 2GG3, uh, that we estimate through the through a, uh, a study of the R5A to excuse me R10A to R5A eligible areas, that um, that current percentage of R10A property, which is 21.8 percent, would not drop below 20.6 percent. And that's based on uh, the, the study that I just passed out, and there is copies of this presentation, by the way, and that study at the back of the room. Um, this uh, was done today uh, as a revision in, in response to comments that we received yesterday uh, suggesting that uh, mobile homes with value less than $10,000 uh, be included in this because they are residential. So I revised that uh, study to to include those in the evaluation. Uh, didn't make a lot of change to the outcome. There was one parcel that was added because of adding one of those parcels in to the 500-foot uh, calculation. There was another parcel that was removed. And uh, basically, that number remains the same. So um, so that that is the uh, report that, that you have in front of you. And they will be uh, posted in color on our website tomorrow along with this presentation. Uh, also under that study, I wanted to point out that um, there was some discussion last time about whether to specify whether this, uh, this 500 foot perimeter would include parcels in an urban growth area because we're looking at rural density. We had talked about uh, it, it would make sense and it would probably be our, uh, our uh, interpretation as we go forward that it would not, uh, that the, the 500 foot would not include parcels within the urban growth area. I double checked our calculation on the Kaitak property and the original uh, calculation had, had included a few par parcels in the Bellingham UGA. So I recalculated that and the uh, uh, revised average uh, lot size within 500 feet goes from 7.1 acres to 7.4 acres. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Second issue is lot clustering. The compliance order uh, said that the county's reliance on clustering as, as a measure to protect rural character is misplaced because the clustering provisions lack enforceable criteria and that the resulting reserve tracks are not permanently protected. Uh, they particularly cited the existence of aspirational language, things like should and where practical. So our response to that is to um, uh, apply the required reserve area percentage to a reserve area easement on a plat, but not the reserve tract itself. Reserve area percentages, because of that, reserved area percentage percentages are reduced slightly to account for a change in the ability to develop within the reserve area. And also, we removed uh, the aspirational wording that the hearings board was talking about, the shoulds, the where practical, and changed those to more enforceable criteria. Number three, Lake Whatcom, uh, we've had uh, uh, quite a bit of discussion on that already. This is related to that. Um, we're proceeding with, with uh, the, the item that you just discussed earlier. That's, that's at the heart of issue three here, and that's how we're addressing this issue. Issue four, rural neighborhoods. The uh, compliance order from our 2012 ordinance found that the designation of rural neighborhood was in compliance with the GMA, but found that three of the uh, rural neighborhoods that were created, the Fort Bellingham Marietta, the North Bellingham, and Welcome, have boundaries that include larger parcels. Uh, the board remanded the ordinance to the county to consider redrawing those boundaries. And this, this gives the language of the compliance order. 
So the proposed boundaries, as were arrived at on uh, June 4th when the ordinance was adopted, are shown here. Uh, Fort Bellingham Marietta parcels to the west and to the northeast are proposed to um, uh, be removed from the rural neighborhood boundary and go to rural, and they would be uh, rezoned to uh, remove the uh, asterisk, the overlay uh, designation, the rural residential density overlay, and, and um, to rezone some of the area, but not all of it, to from two acre zoning to a five acre zoning. Some of it's already five acre zoning. North Bellingham, similar situation. Um, parcel boundaries are drawn to exclude some of the larger parcels on the perimeter. Welcome, this is one where the uh, rural neighborhood designation is removed altogether. And here are some figures for the rural neighborhoods, uh, the results of these changes. And you can see here in both Fort Bellingham and North Bellingham, there are some pretty significant redux reductions in terms of total acres, in terms of the number of parcels greater than five acres, uh, the potential for new lots to be created within, within these uh, larger parcels, and also that the average, developed, the average size of a developed parcel um, goes down slightly in each case, so it obviously stays under our one or 2.5 acre criteria for designating our rural neighborhood. Issues five, six, and seven, um, no, under, under the ordinance that was introduced last time on the fourth, no action is being proposed on these. The council added a, a conclusion in the ordinance document and the findings and conclusions that says the county and property owners in, an effect, in the affected areas have appealed several issues on which the board found the county out of compliance. With the adoption of this ordinance, the county has opted not to take action on these issues on appeal and at the present time does not intend to take action until they are reviewed by the courts. Last issue, issue eight. Water lines. Compliance order uh, found that our amended code provision fails to comply with state law because transmission lines would be allowed outright throughout the rural area without transmission being defined as, a, as excluding a service connection. They also noted that there's a provision in the health code that requires service connections to adjacent transmission lines. The response to that is that 2082-030 3B permits extension of water lines for rural uses, but prohibits extension of water lines for urban uses. And that's in, in conformance with the GMA definitions of rural and urban governmental services because uh, water is both an urban and a rural governmental service. Um, so, so we use the, the GMA definitions of those very, very closely. Also, we added a new uh, definition to 2097. It's 2097-452, uh, water transmission lines, and that is a verbatim uh, definition right out of uh, the WAC, the Washington Administrative Code. And finally, changed uh, the health code, proposes changing the health code, changing references from transmission lines to water lines. Our schedule up to this point, uh, we've had several work sessions and uh, public hearings. We had a public hearing on March 28th with the Planning Commission, had a public hearing on May 21st with the County Council, and uh, tonight is our third public hearing on this, on this issue. Compliance deadline is July 3rd, and uh, sometime in October, uh, maybe as soon as August, a, a compliance hearing is, is going to be scheduled. That's it for the presentation. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you, Gary. Oh, Councilmember Knutson. You know, on the changes to the water transmission lines, um, where they no service connections are allowed along the transmission main, does that is that for existing all, uh, all, as well? Existing transmission. Well, lines? if there's hookups to the existing transmission main. Uh, is is that going to create an issue? I, I would have to look at the language. I don't have it in front of me. We, we discussed it quite a bit last time, I believe. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
And you say this is this came from where this language you you referenced uh, the language that um, that defines transmission lines is right out of the uh, Washington Administrative Code, the WAC. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Did you have a question, Councilmember Kremen? Uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, I I feel hesitant to do this, but we have to have a okay. public hearing. Okay. How? how um, okay. I'll. I'll I'll defer <clears throat> any comments or ideas or thoughts until after we hear from the public. Yes, oh, yes. Now you get my curiosity. This, these are just clarifying questions for Gary. So seeing none, I'll let Gary sit down and I'll open the public hearing. And we've got two people signed up, Laura Lee Brocky and Brad Swanson. So Laura, you want to come down? Road. Um, this has been a long process, and you can see how many public hearings we've had, how many people can actually keep the stamina to show up for this. <clears throat> I don't hardly have the stamina, but I did show up, um, and during the course, I suggest that we use the money in item 11 that finance committee was going to review the 40 to $90,000 of more money to fight growth management, we could turf that to the fourth superior court judge. My recommendation on that. I'm really asking you not to spend any more taxpayers' money fighting a good law. So, um, I do believe in the power of laws, and I believe that laws are not just the purview of lawyers, but that citizens should be able to read them and understand them, and that we should expect that our local officials will enact those laws. We spend a lot of time fighting growth management. Why not give it a chance to work? So... I guess I better put my glasses on. Actually, Kathy Kirshner had a comment about special interests, and you do know that I'm a party to the Hirsch et al., because I believe in the power of laws. When I read a law and I see people aren't following it, that's why I'm part of that. I don't think that's a special interest, so... I'd say a special interest is when you have your property listed in the body of an ordinance and you have a lawyer who's fighting for you at every hearing, whether it's afternoon or night, because they're paid to come there. Most citizens can't keep up with this overlong process. And um, many of the folks that are asking for upzone and don't want to downzone never tested their rights. Oh, boy. Hmm. So, anyway, I don't think I'm a special interest, and Whatcom County is a very unique piece of the world, and I think we should protect it. And my special interest is making sure laws are followed, that all five Pacific salmon continue to come back to our streams. There's not too many places that have that ability, and we're losing it. Time. And, um, Thank you, Laura. Brad Swanson? Thank you very much, members of the council, Brad Swanson, the Belcher Swanson Law Firm. Here on behalf of Doug Puller, uh, the Buloses, and Smith Gardens, I'm not going to recite the materials that have been submitted on these issues already. I just will note for the council that today uh, Mr. Puller's supplemental declaration was submitted to this council for your consideration uh, tonight. Uh, but tonight I simply ask that the council finish its work on this ordinance and uh, pass it. Thank you very much for your hard work on this. Clarifying question? Yes, Councilmember Crawford? I read that prior to the meeting and I didn't understand it. It was simply Mr. Puller saying that he bought that lot for investment purposes, but it didn't tie that reasoning with a GMA uh, Growth Management Act. I, I, I didn't understand what that had to do with the Growth Management Act uh, and what we're trying to comply with. Uh, as you know, Councilmember. Crawford, the the record 
upon which appeals are taken is made here. So right. Mr. Puller is perfecting his record in case there is uh, further dispute with the okay. Growth Management Hearings Board in this matter. So that's, that's your story and you're sticking to it. That's okay. It. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to us on this um, ordinance? Come on up. Kate Blystone, FutureWise, Watcom. Um, we submitted our letter today, and we submitted it today because basically it's the same as almost every other letter we've submitted in the last couple weeks on this issue. Um, we have a number of concerns um, remaining with this ordinance. The proposal in front of you today. Uh, first, on the variety of rural densities, you know that you were found out of compliance um, based on not having adequate protections to prevent rezones from R10 to R5, putting it basically. Um, so we have some suggested language for that. The, the proposal is fairly good, um, but we think that there should be more consideration for some of your natural resource lands. So we've added um, uh, four criteria, and I'll read those to you very quickly, not incomplete, but uh, first we think that the proposed rezone should not be adjacent to existing area designated rural um, resource lands. So various, the resource land criteria. Um, the area has a rural comprehensive plan designation. We think that would be an important criteria to include into the variety um, or the, the criteria for rezones from R10 to higher densities. No priority habitats excluding um, streams or rivers based on a GIS database from Fish and Wildlife. And then finally, um, the area is not closed to appropriation of service water and groundwater uh, for reasons that probably should be obvious. Um, so we think that the criteria that we're adding would protect rural character. And the hearings board said, quote, measures to protect rural character, that the plan lacked, quote, measures to protect rural character to contain rural development. So in addition to that, we think that um, it would be wise to uh, adopt instead staff's recommendation for the rural neighborhoods and the uh, Lamards that, that you're looking at tonight uh, for issue four, six, and seven. Um, the hearings board was fairly clear on these issues, and I really think that uh, it would be in your best interest to come back with something different than what you came away with last time. Finally, um, uh, one other issue is that, uh, and we've said this and I mentioned it earlier, that we don't think that cluster zones should, uh, clusters should be greater than eight lots, and we cite some case law for that in our, in our letter, so I urge you to look at that. And finally, um, we recognize that it's going to take you some time to incorporate these changes and maybe others that are presented tonight, and we wanted to let you know that we would support an extension of time for compliance. So if you do file for an extension, FutureWise would be in support of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak to the council? Come on up. Yeah, can you please line up if you're going to speak to us? Good evening. David Stallheim, Whatcom County. And, you know, I didn't want to come here tonight because you guys offend us by your comments that you're making. You calling us special interests, calling us domestic terrorists in public settings, not listening to our comments, not reading our stuff. Mr. Swanson just talked about perfecting the record. That's what we're doing. So we submitted information on takings issues with respect to Mr. Bulas' property. So if that's the kind of game that you want to play, and you want to play hardball, we will do that. And it's going to be long and it's going to be expensive as part of that. I'm kind of hoping that there might be four reasonable minds that will sit down and talk about this, because actually you're pretty close on a lot of these issues. There's compliant paths for Mr. Bulas. I gave that to Mr. Swanson three, four years ago. He thought it would take too much work to do. So he'd rather litigate it. You chose building sizes in the Guide Meridian area that cause challenges. If Mr. Kremen remembers, we actually had building sizes 
that allowed grocery stores at 35,000 square feet when we passed an ordinance in 2009 at the Planning Commission level. That went poof when this council, previous council, Mr. Kremen wasn't on, evaporated all those things and had unlimited sizes. You create holes, kind of like the 87% of the Lake Wacom thing. You dig holes and then you dig them deeper. Take the time out right now. You have some time. Get an extension. FutureWise just at, said the same thing that they would agree to it. I'm sure our party would agree to it. If there's four reasonable minds to sit down and see if we can hash this out. Stop offending us. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak to us? Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair, I, uh, in, in lieu of the fact that uh, the previous speaker was uh, admonishing and chastising the, the county council, which I think is inappropriate, <clears throat> I believe in free speech, but I also uh, would like an opportunity to respond uh, at, at whatever time you think would be appropriate. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Wendy. Wendy Harris, Mr. Kremen, you're not going to like what I have to say then. <clears throat> we live in a country ruled by law. These laws are not optional, and they cannot be opted out of because of a good faith ideological disagreement. Yet that is the course of action repeatedly chosen by the council majority. Council needs to set an example for our citizens and ensure compliance with the rules that hold our society together by respecting the institution of government at all levels, federal, state, and local. Instead, council has attempted to undermine public respect for the integrity of our system of government by ridiculing the hearings board delegated authority under state law. You have criticized and ridiculed those who have challenged the council under the very legal procedures that were lawfully established. In these actions, you have failed the public by mocking the very system of government under which you were elected. And even worse, you're doing this with somebody else's money. You have shown disregard for the high cost of your irresponsible behavior and refusal to comply with state law. It is time to stop protecting developers in their attempts to skirt the laws intended to protect public health and safety and time to start spending money coming into compliance with the GMA. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Does anybody else wish to speak to us? Seeing nobody rising, I will close the public hearing. And what are the wishes of the council? Um, I'll move. Uh, Councilmember Crawford? Well, I'll move approval of the overall ordinance. I, I think probably a number of us would like to propose some amendments or changes based on the hearing tonight, but uh, for the sake of discussion, I'll move the entire ordinance. Okay. So the ordinance is moved. Does anybody wish to propose changes or amendments? Well, <laughs> Councilmember Crawford? <laughs> that said, I've got one, but it's not based on something that was said tonight. It was something that uh, I read, in, I discovered, and, and I did have a brief discussion with uh, Gary Davis before the meeting tonight. Um, page 713 of the packet. which is uh, 2036-305. Yeah, a lot of clustering. Um, we had an exception that, as far as I can tell, inadvertently the exception got left out on item number three under 2036-305. Item number three begins with the words lot clustering. It's about in the middle of the page. Okay, it used to read, and this, this is not, uh, unless Mr. Davis, after contemplating it, this was a couple hours ago I talked to him, but at the time he was thinking about it, we, this, the change that caused this language to be changed was because we don't use the term short-term planning area and long-term planning area anymore. Um, but the, what happened in the way this got worded, it left out an exception to being required to cluster that has not been commented on by the hearings board and was not part of the um, 
the response to the hearings board. So I'll read it the way it used to read, and then I'll read what the changes, and I'll describe um, what got left out. Lot, item three used to read, lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when A, the property is located within a short-term planning area and public water and sewer are not available, or B, the property, I'm sorry, yeah, the property is located within an urban growth area reserve. I'm sorry, the property was located within a long-term planning area. And, and understand that we're excluding the requirement for clustering. I'm sorry, we are requiring, not excluding, let me, I had it backwards because I'm just still trying to track with this. We're, we're requiring clustering, used to require clustering in short-term planning area uh, when public and water and sewer were not available and in a long-term planning area period. What we, in changing this to now read, lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when the property is located within, within an urban growth area reserve. We've left out that exclusion that if they were served by public water and sewer, that they wouldn't be required to cluster. And to fix this, I don't think this is a substantive change to simply add the words after the property is located within, within an urban growth area reserve unless public water and sewer are available. So it would now read, lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when the property is located within an urban growth area reserve as long as public and wa public water, yeah, let me, let me, unless, unless, not yes, unless public water, because I keep reversing this, unless public water and sewer are available. So my motion is to add the words after the word reserve, unless public water and sewer are available. Now I'm going to suggest in defense of that motion to amend that this will impact practically no one, but the concern was brought up to me this past week uh, by lot owners, and I, and I, I you, you got to remember our urban growth area reserves are very limited in the county. They're, they're kind of spread out. I was talking to Gary about where they're at. There's some around Sumas, there's some around Birch Bay. The area that has probably been most contentious is U Street, yes. And there are some parcel owners that are greater than 10 acres up there. As you know, they have been put on hold probably indefinitely. They're in a limbo that makes it almost impossible to develop. And what those property owners have looked at now, with all the millions they've invested in the past that have not come to fruition, is simply developing at the, at the density uh, that, we state, that the city of Bellingham basically caused us to state there, which is one house per 10 acres. And this says they would be limited to doing that in a cluster. But we used to accept out, and that was a short-term planning area, we used to accept out uh, if they had public water and sewer available. Now, whether they do or not, I don't know. Um, I know it is the policy of the city of Bellingham not to extend utilities until the time of annexation. However, I believe that area uh, was subject in the past to some agreed upon developer agreements that may or may not be utility extension agreements and I'm not sure that could be legally resolved nor should we attempt to do that here tonight. However, I think we should change this language and I believe Gary made the, proposed this change and it didn't get much discussion uh, simply to eliminate the concepts of short-term and long-term planning areas, but we neglected to allow that one exception, which is if you have public water and sewer, you are not required to cluster. So that is the basis for my motion. And I'm sure Karen has no idea what to think of all of that. All right, Councilmember Brenner. Yeah, um, it sounds interesting to me. Can we have a short executive session? I'm sure Karen has no idea what to think of all that. 
Well, I guess my question is, is would that be a substantive change? And it seems like that kind of I, question. I, I don't think I can answer that right now. Maybe Gary and I can step aside and talk about this a little more, and I will have a, a better idea. I mean, this is totally taken me by surprise. Right. I have not. I only talked to Gary before the meeting tonight, and I have not had a chance to sit down with Karen on it. I, I just want to clarify with the, with the uh, accept and unless um, what what you're proposing is is it the same as what was in place yes. before for a short-term planning area yes. or is it the opposite it's the same as what happened when they were when they were in the short-term planning area those property owners and i don't want to isolate this to a single property those property owners were not required that had 10 acres or more were not required to cluster if they had water and sewer and now we're saying okay. that those same property owners would have to cluster, and we don't talk about whether or not they have water and sewer. Quite honestly, based on my experience and understanding of that area, I have significant doubts that they could get to that high bar of demonstrating to the city that they must provide water and sewer to those areas. It's not in the city limits. Well, well, However, I don't understand why we would eliminate that exception. And I'm not even going to the issue that originally existed of why they were allowed that with with 10 acre lots i'm not even going to go there and try to talk about the history i'm simply saying i think we do a disservice to people to change the code uh in terms of how it impacts them when they've all these people in particular when they've already been down zoned from four units per acre or whatever to one house per 10 acres to uh, add the additional layer that if they feel they've got a case and can make it to the city that they have an agreement that the city will provide water and sewer that they can't uh, that they're uh, have the added restriction of clustering and again I don't want to get into a debate as to why they were allowed that exception before I'm arguing this based on why would we make the change And, and so I'm, you're not proposing a change to what we have now. In effect, it's it's just what exists already. Mm -mm. He's proposing a change. No. Do you understand it's, what I'm saying? I mean, um, our, that is my intent. Right. Now, what they have now, if they want to make a case that they were in a short-term planning area or they want to make a case that they do or don't have water or sewer provision, as far as I'm concerned, that's their problem. I'm simply saying, why would we change? And, and you know, I, I heard from one property owner in that area. However, um, you know, as Gary pointed out to me before the meeting, we do have these in little pockets around the county, and this could impact other people. I don't know. We haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't received any uh, testimony. I asked the people if they would come down here tonight and testify and put something on the record about it, but they're out of town today and, and are unable to do it. Well, what we have today uh, is the is the verbiage that is struck out, which is, which refers to a short term planning area, which we don't have anymore. So we wouldn't, I don't think, really have the option of leaving it. I suppose we could. I don't know that it would make much sense. No, it but, wouldn't make sense. Yeah. But, and so the the. Um, the urban growth area reserves are not in all cases the same thing as short-term planning areas no yeah uh, again short-term planning but areas some are right right some are right and i believe and, and they believed again i'm just taking it face value that they were in a short-term planning area there you and I, th I think i'm pretty sure the ug u street uga did not include any long-term planning areas or if it did they were on the east side of u street not on the west side uh, but uh, I don't think they had really short-term planning areas and long-term planning areas were located in UGAs right which That's they how were UGAs were divided right. out in this case this used to be part of a UGA yes. uh, now it's not now it's in an urban reserve so it's it's a different situation I suppose if we really wanted to get diligent about it I would make my amendment and I'm just thinking out loud here unless um, unless they 
have public water and sewer and were previously in a designated yeah. short-term planning That's area. That's one way to do it. Can we do it. that? I, well, mean, could, could we, I mean, are we making good law, though, to force planning to go back and try to figure out what used to be? Or I guess we do that on Well, occasion. basically, you're maintaining the status quo when you put language like that okay. in. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll change that to add right. the words, and were previously in a designated short-term planning area. And we're in a previously designated short-term planning area. Should we put a date or a number of years that they were in it? Um, for more than 10 years. That would be pretty safe to say about U Street. <laughs> I don't think we need to add a, a time frame on it. Now, now, the other question is, is this something that we could do based on the introduced ordinance from the June 4th, or is it something we could yeah, is it add tonight? Well, if, if you're not changing what exists now. Well, short-term planning areas don't exist now. N no, but well, in I a mean, qualifier they did. that it had to have been in. I just added that qualifier, yeah. that they I mean, did exist at one time and it had to have been in it. But they don't exist now is what I'm thinking. Well, I know, but <laughs> but but by adding that language, you're restricting that just to the areas that formerly were short-term planning areas and and were I, I don't see that you're substantively changing what exists now I, well it's the ordinance that we are working on no that was introduced. Have to no I mean if you're not making a change to what the law currently is well, then 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 you don't have to have a public hearing to address that. So yeah, my, my motion is to, uh, after the word reserve, add the words, unless public water and sewer are available and the property was entirely contained within a previously designated short-term planning area. Okay, Councilmember Brenner. I'm writing on the board. Is this sound right? Yeah. Short-term planning area. Yeah, and maybe put short-term planning area in quotes so that someone in the future will realize that, was, or with capital letters or whatever, so someone will realize that was a uh, county, a previous county designation. Member Brenner. Well, I just want to, so you don't think it's substantive. My only, I, like I'm looking at this, this is what we put on for introduction and what we've been working on. Is it okay to go to something else, even though it was something that was before? Yes. I don't know. If okay. you're not proposing a change to what currently exists, you don't have to have a public hearing to address it because it's not a change. Hmm. Because we haven't finalized it yet, is that it? No. It's because this language basically reverts to the law that already exists. Right? <laughs> not not yeah, really, because we've changed it. No, you're, you're putting it back by adding this language, you're putting it back to how it exists right now. Okay. Any other comments or discussion on the motion to amend? Are people still thinking about it or are we ready to vote on the motion to amend? No, that's not substantive. Councilmember Knudsen? Yeah. Um I, I'm, I'm unclear that, but previously it read um, where public water and sewer are not available. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that we are making a change? 
Um, it was requiring clustering. This is, is requiring, it was requiring clustering. clustering in short-term planning areas when public water and sewer were not available. What they were trying to do was, was require clustering in long-term planning areas. And then, the then they, the, the, someone had the thought, well, there's short-term planning areas and public water and sewer aren't available, so they added that. So, but so so the the, the, per, the property owners in question uh, that I, that contacted me were sitting there saying, well, we believe we have an agreement with the city of Bellingham to extend services. We now want to pursue it. This will all be at their own cost, of course. Right. But we want to do it at the and the and the agreement is to extend services only to the existing zoning. Does this existing zoning is one house per ten acres? However, when they look at at moving forward with the proposal, we're saying they have to cluster, and under the old rule, they did not have to cluster. So this change makes it so that they will be accepted out of the clustering requirement, just like they were accepted out before. See, they, they didn't meet the requirement to cluster before because they had water and sewer. And you were only required to cluster in the short-term planning area if it was not available. Okay. I'm still... It it's, it's, it's a double... It's like a double negative swapped over is what it is. It negative. takes your mind a couple mental gymnastics That's why to I had get a hard it. time saying it at the first, but I think the, the language... <laughs> would, is, but it's would really it be, not a change. <laughs> would it be clear to say the property is located within an urban growth reserve and public water and sewer are not available? Not available. Yeah, I like that better. That was how you said it before, yes. are now not available. It. You're public. almost saying it backwards, Sam, and it might be the same thing, but it's confusing. Let's type something up there and let's look at it. Well, if you read A. See, that, that three, mirrors the language that is that existing. That was there. Right. A. You could re-add, just re-add re A for that matter. Oh, so you would change A and change, get rid of the word short-term planning area and add the words... Um, um, Word, unless and, and add, add the and. Word urban growth area reserve. Yeah, let's put it back the way it was. I, the, the way it is now, it's just one sentence without an A and a B, and I think it works pretty well that way. The property is located within an urban growth area reserve, and public water and sewer are not available. Not and it's a lot of ands. And the property was previously contained within a designated short-term planning area. Yeah, it's fine with me. It, 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 re, it, it does reestablish, it's a lot of ands, but it does reestablish the specific criteria that they, they could uh, develop without clustering. In the specific language. All right. That's not changing the meaning then of the first phrase that the property is located within an urban growth area is required to cluster if we add all those ands? I don't believe so. Okay. Now I'll remind you too that you, you if do you do cluster and you go into an urban growth area like an urban reserve should, then you can develop that uh, reserve area. That that reserve area easement does not it stays in perpetuity until while it's in the rural area, but not when it goes into the urban growth area. So, Gary, quick correction: you have to since we turned it into uh, a, a requirement for clustering, you have to change, and we've we've changed the water and sewer not available. You, after the word property was, you have to say not previously contained within a designate. You have to put the word not. If we're going to add not on water and sewer, you've got to do. See, we're not going to require them to cluster. So it should say lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when the property is located in, within an urban growth area reserve and public water and sewer are not available and the, and the property was not previously contained within a designated short-term planning area. Well, it's, read, read it reads pretty again. rough. Yeah. Read A again because the property is located within a short-term planning area and public water and sewer are not available. Right. 
clustering is required if it's within and the, the stuff's not available. It is within a short-term planning area and water and sewer are not available. And that's what we're saying here. Water sewer and sewer are not available and the property was previously contained within a short-term planning area. Does that make sense? I have one question. Okay. I, it's, it's tough to get your mind around. Could we just keep A and put the property was previously located and then get rid of all the rest of it under B that we've added? Does that make it clearer? The property was located within a short-term planning area. It was previously located because we don't have short-term planning area. The is required for this. The property was previously, yeah. Well, yeah. Then that opens it up to all parcel, all properties that were at one time within a. Mm. If you use that or, it's either any parcel that was in a short-term planning area, or it's in an urban reserve, urban growth no, area reserve. No, both. Need yeah, was. either or. Yeah, you need to use and. Instead of or. If that's what you're trying to do, is to say if. It's in an urban growth area reserve. And was previously, and was previously in a short term. Public oh. water and sewer not available. And, and the property was, was previously contained within a short term yes. planning area. That's. I think you need all those ands if that's what you're trying to do. Then you need to do log clustering. Okay. Then it's required. Is that okay um, with you? Yeah, well, that was, that was what I was getting at. I think Council Member Kirshner is right. Um, you're going to re be required the way that that sentence reads now to have all all those criteria, yep. whereas right. where it was established before, um, the wording that it what that was stricken, it was the property is located within a short within a short term planning area previous. and public water and sewer are not available, or B the property is located within an urban growth area reserve. Um, I th I think. I think the, the way it was originally in here um, is better than what's currently worded with the and, and it, it, it reads like all three are required. We got rid of short term plan. Gary, move your cursor. It's blocking the. Oops. There, thank you. We, I thought we got rid of short term plan. No, they, it's previously contained within uh -huh. designated short term planning area. It's still in there, and when if you look at the way this was originally worded, if you look on page seven thirteen, and look at A, and then look at B, I'm looking right at it. And um, there it gave, it said the property, and it was or. But I thought when we did this, I think I'd be okay. comfortable. If, I'm sorry, Councilor Crawford. My, 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 I would just offer a friendly amendment that we. Re-add the wording, um, the way it was ori originally worded, with um, the only the only changes being to be striking long-term planning area at the end. Councilmember okay. Crawford, I'm not, I'm not going to make accept that as a friendly could, amendment. Could I? Um, I, 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 I just would like to suggest that you get rid of the and in front of public, because that would really infer that all three conditions need to be met. So it would read, lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when the property is located within an urban growth area reserve, comma, public water and sewer are not available, comma, and the property was previously contained within a designated short-term planning area. That would keep the law exactly as it sits today. Yeah. Okay. Karen? Well, Gary and I spoke about this briefly, and, and the problem with, with saying you're maintaining the status quo is that short-term planning areas don't exist and so they haven't existed for some time and so that particular criteria really hasn't had any meaning and you're bringing that meaning back to life and and so I think it is changing things and and it would be a substantive change and what okay we're under some deadlines aren't we? Yeah. So could we remove yeah. the and the property was previously contained within the designated short-term planning area and still meet the same? No, I no. think it would no, be a substantive be so. change. Because now that yeah. really starts to change. Yeah. yeah. You withdraw uh, your motion, right, whatever it was. Well, I'll 
I'll withdraw the amendment. I, uh, you know. Okay, what else? It's just another, it is changing the situation for real people out there in Whatcom County. I thought you said and you it's not a decision and it's it not a it's, it's a change that has not been required by the hearings board has not been appealed to the hearings board uh, and is not responsive to the hearings board's orders which is what we're trying to address uh, but granted you know if if the fact that they used to be you know I think maybe what I hear and I'm just playing devil's advocate here maybe what I hear our attorney saying is well shoot you could go back and look at a whole lot of past zoning criteria. Um, the, my issue with this particular one is that past zoning criteria happened to sit there in today's code, even if the short-term planning area, I mean, we're talking about language that currently exists, and at least it's the perception of this property owner, they could move forward with uh, what they thought was going to be four or six acre development, and now it's going to be one per 10 acre development without clustering. But I'll withdraw it. I, I can't think of a way to, get, to do it based on what our attorney just told us. Councilmember Knudsen. Okay. Well, I, then I have a uh, an answer that I'm going to run by Gary here. What if uh, the current wording on A, if we strike the property is located within a short-term planning area and and just have public water and sewer are not available, or the property is located within an urban growth area reserve for B, could we list A as just public water and sewer are not available? I think we may have the same problem. Why? We're not making a change. You're, you're making some change yeah, you are. there. Well, what's the change? Um, All we're doing is we're deleting the property is located within the short-term planning area and which was already in this ordinance. Well, it's already in this. Um, but you're applying it to the whole rural area. It still changes the meaning, yeah. I believe. It changes the meaning for lot clustering? Yes. Yeah, all we're well, doing is we're striking something. For, for requiring it, yeah. We're striking something that hasn't been used, short-term planning area, but the public water and sewer are not available as something that has been I think what you're doing, though, is you're you're applying that lot clustering is required for residential developments on parcels 10 acres or greater when water and sewer are not available. That would imply you're applying it to the whole rural area. Are, is that the intention that you want to require lot clustering in the whole rural area? Because the property located within the short-term planning kind of narrows down where you're talking about. So this would broaden it. Well. Your, if you, the way it currently reads would be that it's the only lot clustering is required when the property is located within an urban growth area reserve. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know why it would change it. Because it broadens the areas. No, Councilor oh, Crawford? Yeah, I, I agree with what Councilor Kushner said. This is uh, 2036, the rural district, and what these rules apply to the entire rural district. Yeah. So if it says this or this. Right. You know, what I, what's the difference, can I ask a question? What's the difference, Gary, between this and the lot clustering requirement of the ag protection overlay of 20 acres or more? Is this regulating lot clustering? Um, oh, in urban growth area reserves only. Okay, I'm sorry. Not the entire rural area. In the entire rural area that has urban growth area reserves within those reserves. That's the only place this applies. As currently written. But if we change. The way the June 4th language reads. Right. Okay, so. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to. Leave it alone. I, I, I can't figure out a way to do it. And based on our uh, consultation here, I'm, I mean, I think, we, I think we're under deadline. I think we need to get yeah. this passed. And okay. I think I don't see a way to do it without that substantive change that um, based on some old planning terminology that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Are there any other amendments or discussion on the ordinance? 
Madam Chair. Oh. Councilmember Kremen. Uh, I was going to actually ask for uh, the council to reconsider the ordinance. But after the Crawford filibuster, I am ready to vote. <laughs> okay. Councilmember Mann. Well, before we vote, I just want to give one last attempt at mediation. Now, I know some people up here don't think it's a productive avenue. I, I just, I think sometimes we get in our trenches and we want, we want to fight. I know I've been there in life and on the council. Just you just feel like you want to fight, and I relate to that. I just think. There may be more to be gained in this process by sitting down with the folks who are advising us on these land use issues and sitting in a room and finding out if there's a path to compliance, as Mr. Stahlheim said. I think we might get more that way than uh, can just keep going and going and going at the, at the Growth Management Hearings Board. So I... I would just like to put that out there one last time. I think that is, I think we might get more of what we want that way than just fighting. Council Member Knudsen and then Brenner. Um, yeah, mediation to me is, is a, a no, but arbitration is something I would look into. If we could get a legal opinion on this would be great. Council Member Brenner. The problem is you have to appeal it or the clock runs out. That doesn't preclude us doing arbit whatever, mediation, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, I think we could do both. Well, but they, I don't want the clock running out. And they offered to, tonight, they offered or they indicated that they would support uh, a request to extend for six months our deadline. That would also give us a chance to further investigate the Crawford filibuster. And per perhaps, <laughs> though, perhaps a negotiated settlement where we get the Bulos and the Polar properties in. I mean, I think that's really the, the painful part of this for a, a lot of folks. And, I, you know, from what Mr. Stahlheim said today, and I haven't talked to him outside of this, but I, I, I've been advocating for mediation. And from what I heard tonight, we could get an extension and possibly work it out and get the things we really want by working collaboratively instead of just, you know, going, going to fight, even though I, I understand that impulse. I just want to weigh in on that and say that um, I think that we have worked collaboratively. We've um, taken this issue, these issues from 24 issues down to currently we're working on eight. We've got language that we believe our, uh, that our planning commission, our planning department, um, the community as a whole has heard and has had an opportunity to comment on. And I don't think that we're fighting. We're actually trying to come into compliance here. Um, so I would be happy to sit down and talk about the issues, but I think that you do that before you have an appeal deadline looming on July 3rd. Um, and, and I think we're working on this, Councilmember Mann. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we need to pass this. This takes care of the latest round of appeals. And then if um, the folks at FutureWise want to tell us that we're still not in compliance and want to work with it, then we can work with it. But we don't really have, I mean, the process is, we're at the end of the process. We're not at the beginning of the process. So. Well, I just... To respond to that, I have been advocating for this approach. Yes, all along. you have. You <laughs> and, have. And if, uh, I, I don't think this is going to be in compliance. And I didn't think about that. I didn't think the last round was going to be in compliance either. I voted for it anyway. But this time, I'm still. I still don't think we're going to be in compliance. 
I'm probably not going to vote for it. Well, two-thirds of the last round were found in compliance because we went from 24 issues to eight. Uh, we're working on it. We're trying to get there. It's taking a very, very long time. It is, but that's government. That's government. It's good government to be careful and considerate. Councilmember Brenner? Yeah, I'm going – well, he had his hand up before me. Councilmember so. Kremen? Thank you. That's very generous and well, courteous of you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'd been approached six months ago or maybe even longer by Mr. Stahlheim to, to mediate this, and I was pretty receptive to the idea. I think at the time I thought there really was the potential to strike an accord that uh, would be fair to all. Uh, in the end, uh, unfortunately, um, I, I, the will of the council at that time was not conducive. There, I don't think there was enough, in my opinion, I don't think there was enough uh, support to to go that route. Um, but I do have to say that Council Member Kirshner's assertion that, uh, you know, that we have really tried to uh, find the middle ground and try to be reasonable and, and strike a balance, um, I think we really, we, I think we've achieved that. In, in, and it's been evidenced in the fact that, you know, we've gone from 24 issues out of compliance down to eight. Um, I happen to concur with Councilmember Mann. I, I, I have doubts that uh, if we are to pass what this document the way it is tonight uh, to the hearings board, that it will pass muster. That it, but you know, you never know. Uh, but I do want to say, and I think this is probably the appropriate time, you know, I, I want to put this in context because Whatcom County, in my opinion, has, has really gone the extra mile to try to get into compliance with the Growth Management Act in spite of what what everybody's perception is. I, at the time, when I was county executive, and Mr. Stahlheim was our planning department director, uh, worked very closely, actually. And we were trying to um, get the county into compliance. The council, as was uh, pointed out by Mr. Stahlheim earlier, it was a different council, and um, what we passed, what the council passed, was not what the administration put forward. But I asked Mr. Stahlheim, why is it Whatcom County is not in compliance, and why is it so hard? Why do I get all these calls from the planning department, or actually from people that have been dealing with the planning department, three, four, five times a day from different constituents who found it unable to work with the planning department, or at least get what they wanted from the planning department, permits for whatever. And the response from Mr. Stahlheim was, Pete, Whatcom County has some of the strictest, if not the strictest, land use regulations in the state of Washington. And I think that conversation, I think I had two conversations that, that uh, expressed that, that sentiment. And I, f I find it very frustrating because I think Whatcom County 
the county organization, the administration, and, and the council has really tried to uh, be more receptive and be, you know, go the extra mile to try to, to get in compliance. But, it, you know, Whatcom County, no matter what we do, the way the system's set up, the way the legislature, and I'm to blame because I was there, but we didn't understand at the time. We had no idea that these growth management hearings boards were going to were, were were going to be uh, unbridled with no accountability. And in this particular case, with with the hearings board that we're dealing with, in my opinion, has overstepped its bounds, has been unreasonable, and uh, we find ourselves in the situation that we are out of compliance. But having said all that, I think that there's some merit and maybe the potential to work with uh, work with FutureWise and those in, involved in, um, you know, opposing uh, what we've put forward every step of the way, and and maybe there really is a a, a sincere and genuine willingness on their part, because I know there is on our part to try to come to some sort of a. a, a compromise, meeting of the minds, give and take, whatever you want to call it, and finally get this issue behind us and ultimately get in compliance with the Growth Management Act. Councilmember Brenner? Um, I agree with a lot of what you say about working with them. I personally feel like it's – I don't think it's going to take that much time to submit – the appeal, and I do think our attorney is pretty good at that. So we can, I just like the foot in the door with this because I don't want this to keep dragging on, and I'm concerned that we'll go six more months and then we'll be back to where we are now. Um, I, I feel like the little extra amount of time it would take to submit the appeal, not even, and then, you know, they, they can work with us and we can work with them. There's one thing, I have not heard this word mentioned at all tonight and very rarely at any other time. The gr we do not know if we are in, I believe we are in compliance with the Growth Management Act. What we're not in compliance with is a political decision from a political board. And this, they are not, they were supposed to be sort of a mediation board actually. They were supposed to help prevent us from being in court, and they've, it's just added an extra layer. The word that I've been thinking about so much is deference. Deference is supposed to be paid to the county, unless we are just, you know, clearly out of compliance. There have been so many of these little pick, pick, pick things, and we've, we've, you know, let we've compromised and compromised and compromised, and. I have never said anything publicly rude to anybody in FutureWise or anybody else, so I kind of do resent those comments. I said the hearings board is a political body, and they sure are. And so I'm stating a fact, and that makes me rude. Uh, I just, I feel like, you know, there was a threat made tonight that you want to play hardball? Okay, fine, let's play hardball, and we'll just keep doing this. Um, I don't think, I think there's a problem there, too. I'm okay. I would like to work with them and work some things out. But I feel like we have just given away, you know, so many people's um, concerns and promises and all kinds of things. Uh, I, I'm just not sure. I don't want to do it without at least filing the appeal. Because if we can't work it out with them, then we don't have to wait another six months. That's all. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Councilmember.
here. We, we dealt with that earlier. This is a with Mr. Mann and Mr. Kremen that I think it's worth uh, taking them up on their offer of delaying the compliance deadline and having a discussion with them and finding out what we can find out. I can't vote for this tonight because I'm pretty sure that uh, there's a, at least a couple of issues in here that we're going to be found out of compliance again. So we're just spending money going back and forth, and it seems like it would make more sense to have a conversation if they're willing to delay the deadline and, and find out. So they asked for four reasonable voices. It sounds like there's three of us up here. Is there one more? 